Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored today to welcome to the show from Caribou Regional District in British Columbia, Director Steve Forsath. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. An honor to be here. So, Steve, I want to get the first question out of the way, and it's the most important question that sets up the entire interview. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Oh, <laughs> you know, that's a real tough one. And um, as I was preparing for this interview, I was really struggling to figure this out. So I, I guess I would go back to um, back in elementary school, of course, one of the um, social study um, courses was on government primarily provincial and federal, um, local governments didn't have a, uh, a prominent role um, way back when. And I think over the years, um, something pulled at your heartstrings. And, and then um, just over the last 20 some odd years, I've been what, what a lot of people would refer to as a super citizen, just being interested in local governments. And then it just progressed over the years to being on a local planning committee in my area, I was actually chair uh, for five years, and then I became alternate director for my area. That's sort of like when the elected director is not available, I go in on their behalf. And then it led to me being elected in 2014, 18, and 2022. Okay. So with that being said, I want to start way back in elementary school. You're right. Municipal politics is not usually discussed at the uh, at the at, at the school level. It's usually federal or provincial. And I'm I I was the same way back in Ontario when I was growing up. Provincial politics was discussed. Federal politics was discussed, but it wasn't municipal. What happened between elementary school and about twenty years ago, where you decided municipal local governance is where the action is happening? Um, so, uh, after I sort of, um, graduated from high school in 1997, um, sort of had a few years to sort of, um, think about things. And then, uh, the mayor of William Zake at the time, um, was making what I would call some, maybe some slopless, uh, sloppy errors. So, um, that's sort of how it got started. And then, um, my very first election was in 2005, uh, running for Williams State Council, wasn't successful. Um, and then um, prior 
just prior to that, I had um, been involved in a couple of City Wings Lake uh, Council committees. Uh, and then I took a stab at running for the regional district here in uh, what we call Area F, so the area, rural area south of Williams Lake. Um, wasn't successful there, um, but my immediate predecessor uh, asked me to become involved in our area in a more intimate way. So it started with serving as chair of our advisory planning commission. Um, and then in 20, late 2012, um, her then alternate director was having some uh, commitment issues to committing to meetings on her behalf. So I um, made a generous and heartful offer to uh, sub in if she felt it necessary. And um, it was only supposed to be for one meeting um, <laughs> because she was going to be absent. And it ended up turning into uh, actually six meetings in that year. So that would have been 2013. Um, unfortunately, she uh, suffered a horseback riding accident. So that akin, uh, uh, acutely left me in charge of the area uh, while she was recuperating. Um, and then um, later that year, she had announced that she wasn't going to seek re-election in the subsequent election, which was the following year. Um, and some residents in McLeese Lake, um, which is one of the unincorporated communities that form uh, my electoral area, had asked me to put my name forward. Um, even though I did say to them, I said, look, I don't live in the area, but I'm willing to do it if you want me to. And they, they said, we don't care. Excuse me, we don't care. Uh, we, um, we know your work habit, your ethics, and we want you to put your name forward. And the following election, I uh, was successful in a three-way race, and then I was subsequently acclaimed in uh, 2018 and 2022. So I, I have a big question, and I apologize for seeing, seeming like the ignorant person on the interview here, but what the heck is a director? I know count, I know municipal government. I know local governance from coast to coast to coast. But BC is the only province that I can see, that I can identify, that you have directors that are elected. So what is the job responsibility of a director, and how does it – relate to municipal governance in that local governance structure that traditionally we we know we are known for in Canada. Yeah, and, and it's it's funny to ask this question because the very people who um brought in the system, which would be the provincial government here in BC, uh back in the mid 60s, uh, because prior to that, uh governing was done by cabinet order down in Victoria. Um what I usually say to people is um, it's similar to the county system in Alberta and the county system in Ontario, similar county system in Nova Scotia. So comparable to a regional councillor. So in my case, there are a number of unincorporated communities that only elect one person. And it's the job of that uh, area director in this case uh, to really understand um, the needs wants, desires, hopes, and dreams of those uh, unincorporated communities and bring that to um, the regional district board. So again, uh, kind of like a, a count, county body that comes together from different parts of that county, if you will, um, and, and to make decisions on behalf of the entire county, or in my case, the entire regional district, which is fairly large. Uh, it goes right up to Hickson uh, between Quinnell Prince George down the 70 mile house, uh, south of 100 mile house. It goes all the way out west of Williams Lake to Anaheim Lake, which is five hours away. And it goes all the way over to uh, Likely, which is about a couple hours east of Williams Lake. So it's a really big geographical area that the Care Regional District covers. So that's the regional district. That's the Caribou Regional District. But you represent in that regional district Ward F, correct? No, oh, uh, Ward D. What, what, Ward, what D. Ward D, sorry. Sorry, you yeah. said F a little bit before. That's why I was a little bit confused. I was like, I thought it was D, but okay. So yeah. in 2012, you just, or 2014, you put your name for it to run for the area, for the regional board. What were the mm -hmm. issues that were going on in the regional district that were prominent in that election? Were they more local issues or were they more macro issues like provincial health care education what was going on in the area during that election do you remember 
Oh, oh, quite vividly. Um, <laughs> I love when um, people can remember back 12 years ago, 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So one of the issues that um, the community of McLeese for example, that was struggling, uh, firstly, is um, they had quite a, a library that was parked within a double wide trailer. And the community said, we want something a little more modern and something that goes back to the 70s. Um, so the community was really struggling um, how to um, get the ball rolling, as it were. So I said, I will make a decision in that term if I'm elected. Um, also, one of the other things that you'll uh, find, and this is not um, limited to just my electoral area, is the question of fire protection from a, a rural unincorporated community perspective. So um, my predecessor and myself as the alternate director went out to um, McLeese Lake and, and said, we know you guys want fire protection. And this had to do with a result of a, an unfortunate um, family head-on collision in um, uh, spring 2012. And the community was quite concerned that there was no um, ability to make sure that these accidents were um, looked after in a timely way. And whether it's head-on collisions, whether it's fire protection, first responder services. So they asked what the option would be available. So um, the regional district took something out to um, the residents and asked, this is what it looks like if you want it to be financed by the local regional district. And they turned, turned it down because it was just too expensive because a lot of property owners have a lakefront property, so their taxes would be considerably higher. So they said we weren't ready to make they weren't ready to make that decision. So from that discussion that the society was formed. So the commitment I gave to the community was I would, if elected, I would continue to work with them. And the other one, and again, I'm I'm not alone as an area director in PDC about this, is the issue of um uh, uh rural health care uh not being um either sustainable or equitable um, uh, across the region. Um, there were concerns about fire protection being delivered by uh, the wildfire service, et cetera. So uh, a few local issues, but some other issues that um, are more long-term. And of course, the one here in BC that gets a lot of play is uh, 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 road uh, rehab and uh, road maintenance. Um, which is managed by uh, BC's Ministry of Transportation. And it's always one that you get ready for every year because you always hear about it. So you've brought up three different areas of discussion that I want to jump in here. But going back to that first election, I know you have been acclaimed in the subsequent elections as per what you've just said. Do you believe, and I'm saying this to you, not to the uh, regional district uh, council, but to you as the director for your area, do you believe you've moved these files forward to be able to go back to the community and say, uh, area residents, we've got more fire protection in our area. We've got better communication and better understanding when it comes uh, to rural health care and being more equitable for our residents. Do you believe that in your time in office, you've been able to accomplish some of the things that people were talking to you about in that first general election back in 2014? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, albeit painfully slow. Um, <laughs> but, uh, how, however, um, you, you know, it, it's always about those um, sort of um celebrating those um, small wins as they come forward. So um, I've tr uh, in the case of fire protection, I've tried to assist the, um, the local fire department society, uh, pointing them to grant opportunities and the like. And up until a few years ago, I was able to, uh, we have a grant for grant and aid program that we could give grants. We're no, lo no longer able to do that due to liability concerns. Um, however, um, I, we do what we can. On uh, road maintenance, uh, again, it's a painful annual conversation. Um, it, it just comes down to the province only has so many dollars uh, to share around rural British Columbia. So, is is it hard to deal with municipal local issues when issues that you're trying to deal with are in the provincial realm? Because I can imagine uh, the the average resident won't care that it's a provincial jurisdiction or a, a municipal jurisdiction or a local jurisdiction. In your case, they want you to solve it. So, is it hard to sort of balance what's going on in your community with the understanding that 
some of these issues aren't in the realm of the uh, local governance and the regional district? Um, strictly speaking, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, broadly speaking, um, what I tend to do is tell res because residents don't necessarily know the nuances of who does what and why they do it and who is contracted out to and the like. So what I tend to do is I say to residents, okay, you're going to come with me with a problem. I want to know what the problem is from your perspective. I want to know what your solution is. Um, and then explain to them what the process is, sort of what I call ping pong. Um, going back and forth between the local residents or resident who brings it to my attention and working it through the system to try and, and get an answer. Um, healthcare and road maintenance, uh, wildfire protection, um, you do really have to have a relationship with the local member legislative assembly um, uh, because they can help you work through the bureaucracy down in Victoria um, to move those balls forward. But um, yeah, residents do get frustrated, like, what, what do I pay property taxes for as a provincial government? And I said, I totally understand, but let's look at the long game here and not um, just say, I want my I want my piece of the pie now. Now, if I go to the regional district tomorrow and I go ask 100 people in your community what the biggest issue is, they're all going to give me different opinions on what they believe is the biggest issue. And you you probably have heard them all. There's going to be some who say education, some say crime, some say hunting, some say this, that, or the other. But you as the director have to make the tough choices when you're presented at uh, the regional district council table on what the best path forward is for everyone. How do you balance the needs? And I'm quoting Spock on Star Trek, and I know I'm going to get lots of emails every time I say this, but how do you weigh the needs of the many with the needs of the few? Because you have to look at the region as a whole, but you can't forget about the individual issues that are important to the people. How do you see yourself doing that as a director? Yeah, that's that's interesting you put it that way. Um, so some issues um, are common to more than just my electoral area um, because they may involve um, service services that we actually deliver as a regional district. So um, I'll give you an example. We actually have a fire protection service with the city of Williams Lake for the rural areas just beyond the boundary of Williams Lake. Um, it's paid for by um, myself and two other colleagues. So in those cases, what we usually do is we might caucus together and say, is the service working for our collective residents? And, and we just had this discussion actually a month ago. Um, some residents were concerned that what they're paying uh, didn't necessarily amount to savings on insurance, for example. So sometimes you have to talk those issues out with your colleagues. And uh, as they say, politics is the art of the possible. So sometimes you have to sort of, as I say, put the put sort of short-term goals aside and, and say what's best for the collective. Um, if it's just to my area, what I like to do often is um, I'm connected through Facebook to a number of community groups through my area. And um, I usually will put a question out or I'll go to community meetings directly and, and hear from residents. And sort of what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep a very open mind uh, and especially more so the more controversial get. Um, and try to under see if there's a consensus of opinion in the uh, wider community. And then what I'll do is I'll filter that through with how I'm feeling and then express that regional district board and uh, make a decision. And uh, is it I tough? Rarely... Sorry, oh, is it, it is. tough? Is it tough to make those decisions? Because you and I both know you're never going to please 100% of the people in your community. And you're always going to have some people who are upset with either way you voted or way you didn't vote. Is it easy for yourself to look people in the eye and say, I, I know you're upset, but I had to look at it for the better good of the the many? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you're right. Um, it's this is not an easy game to play, especially when you're the sole elected official, and there's competing interests from different communities. Uh, I, I do need to go back and I, I say to him, I said, I know you feel strongly this way, but I had to look at the greater good. Um, and I do remind them often that 
they do have the right to hold me accountable at the ballot box um, if they feel that strongly about it, which usually doesn't come home to roost. Um, and the other thing I try to do, Chris, is uh, I try to explain what the issue is, uh, the documents that the board considered in that discussion, and then sort of say, this is how I voted and why I voted. Um, we just had this in actually in 2020 um, when the regional board decided no more grants for assistance to uh, independent fire department in the area. And I, I said, I voted it this way, but the board decided that they weren't willing to take on legal liability risk. And unfortunately, when the residents uh, send you to represent them at the board table and you come back and say, I tried, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is what happened. And, and you just, you really just have to tell residents what went into the thinking and why and what the options are going forward so that at least residents understand what went into my individual thinking and the regional board's uh, thinking. So how big is communications in your job? Because I can imagine for a, such a large area that the region represents, even your electoral district, the area is quite less large compared to a city or a town. How important is it to communicate? You talked about earlier on how you go to community meetings, you have uh, you you reach out. I know you're active on social media. How important is it to communicate the ongoing issues that are going on at the board table, but also the decisions you've made so that way people can understand where you've come from and why you voted on a certain way and uh, why you voted for a certain issue? Um, I actually consider it very important. Um I, I sort of treat this job like an ongoing relationship with the bosses. So the bosses would be the voters um, and I'm their employee. So it's just not enough to say, okay, I did the election. Uh, now I don't have to talk to you for four years until the next election. I, I think it's important that the people who pay your bills uh, also hear from you um, fairly routinely. And I don't limit it, limit it to just uh, what I'm doing as a regional district representative. Uh, I try to give residents a heads up about things that are coming so that uh, for two goals. Firstly, um, I have a sense of where they're at because there are opportunities for me to talk about, for example, provincial issues. It gives me a sense of where they're at so I can advocate for them at the provincial tables. And and secondly, it's really for them to, for me to remain a link between the voters and myself. So um in a rural context, it's, it's really hard because um, newspapers tend to a lot don't um, people tend not to read them all that much and and not and I'll be honest, not everyone's on social media. So I, I think it's like a three legged stool. It's the statutory um, advertising the regional district will do. Uh, the director needs to facilitate that through uh, either in person communication or um, uh, social media communication, and then the third one is making sure you're remaining uh, grounded uh, with your community groups. Uh, and it could be anything from usual society meetings to, and I try to go to as many community events in my electoral areas as I can, as I can make. Uh, I feel strongly that you don't ask residents to come to your communication structures, you go to, you go to theirs, um, whether that's informally or formally to make sure that you're remaining grounded and engaged uh, with them. You're you're speaking my love language there, Steve, because I'm very big a proponent that uh, politicians and local elected leaders can't just sit around for four years and not go talk to people. So in, in that strain of thinking, I want to pose this question to you because it's an important one. You make tough decisions on a weekly basis around that uh, board table. Sometimes you have to approach people and get their opinions. How much weight and responsibility do you put on your shoulders every time you walk into that boardroom and make sure that you're informed on what's being presented in front of you at the from that council report, from that administration report that you get, informed on what the residents want, but understand that you have to keep an open mind until you raise that hand to say yay or nay on an issue because – a fellow director may come with a different opinion that you didn't think of. So how important is it for you to be informed, but not ingrained in what you're going to be voting on? Yeah. And, and that's a, that's a delicate balance. Um, <laughs> so what, what I tend to do is um, I have sort of an, un, 
uh, unofficial um, advocacy uh, body that I, I have a few people that I will engage in if I'm not sure how I'm feeling or if it's something that's never been dealt with from an electoral area director's perspective. So I'll phone up a few people and just say, this is sort of where I'm at. I just want to, I want to get some informal feedback. Um, and then I obviously take the time to read reports. And I'm also connected to a few of my regional district colleagues throughout British Columbia. Um, and I just pose a question saying, hey, I'm dealing with this issue. How did your board deal with it? Um, and what, what was the thinking that went into it? So I, I, I tried to look at issues with open mind, but also um, bear in mind the old saying, no need to re reinvent the wheel. Someone else has done it successfully. Um, so I try to balance all that. And honestly, um, this politics is a relationship business. If you can't maintain good relationships with your own colleagues and, and other colleagues throughout British Columbia and, and Canada, um, you're really not going to be all that successful. Um, so also, the why do you say thing... that? Why do you say that? I apologize because you're the very first person who's openly said that. And I find that fascinating because it is an important thing and it, relationships are important in your field of work because you don't need to reinvent the wheel every single time. But what works for a different regional district may not work for your regional district. So how do you balance your unique situations with what's going on in other communities when trying not to reinvent that wheel. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. Um, I, what I try to do is, is um, if I'm feeling like someone else has done it already, usually what I'll do is I'll go to staff and say, is there a need to, to create something new or can we craft something someone else has done already? and tweak it for our own circumstances. Because you have to remember, every regional district, and there's 27 of them in British Columbia, um, they're all different. Their cultures are different. Their structures are different. Um, how they budget, et cetera, uh, even though it's, it's the same principle, um, uh, they do it differently. So um, trying to balance sort of all those various factors out um, and then coming to a decision, I, I think is critical. So again, research, your relationship with uh, your own colleagues and others in British Columbia, and then just coming to a consensus, hopefully, to make the best decision possible. Is it hard to say no in your job? And I'm gonna, this is the last question before we turn to the next subject here, but I, I can imagine you get approached on a regular basis from people in your district saying, I want this, I want that, I want a bigger community, but you know, and I know that municipalities and local governance doesn't have the money that uh, provincial governments or federal governments have. And sometimes the local governance has the downloading aspect as well that the provincial government and the federal government, is it hard to say no to people and say, unfortunately, we can't do what you want. We would love to, but the financial situation is just not feasible at this time. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. It is tough. Um, so when I get into those questions where someone says, I want A, A, B, or C, I usually have to explain, I say, I need to explain to you the reality, fiscal realities of this regional district. So I explain how it, the process works and what goes into it. So I, I said, I, I hear what you're saying, but um, these are conversations that take a long time to happen. And um, and sometimes it just is not feasible. And I just said, I said, you know, at the end of the day, we tried to make a case for it. And unfortunately, it's just not doable at this time, but maybe one day we'll revisit it. But the other part, and I think you mentioned it about provincial downloading, uh, which is often something I hear about. Um, and I, I always go back to the residents and say, look, we, we are trying our best to advocate for you at the provincial and federal level in concert with our uh, elected officials at provincial and federal level. At level um, and I would say just try your best and and keep trucking forward, as they say. I want to I want to turn to the uh, Caribou Regional District as a whole right now, and I want to preface this question by asking this to you, and only you. This is not a motion of council for those who are listening. This is not a policy of council. This is the director's opinion, and I preface that because we always get emails about this is not what is being talked about at council for some strange reason. People like to yell at me for this question, Director Forsyth. In your opinion. What is the biggest issue or issues 
facing Caribou Regional District today as of recording this? Um, I would say two things. Uh, firstly, um, making sure the communities are protected uh, through wildfires um, as we're recording this. Um, a number of communities in Alberta, obviously, and a number of communities in Northeast BC right now are impacted by wildfires. Um, we, we know probably we'll get our wildfires this year, so it's a question of making sure residents are ready, grab and go bag, all the stuff we've heard over and over and over again. Um, the other one that's really impacting on a number of regional districts right now is asset management and specifically utility systems, whether it's water or sewer. Um, we operate about, uh, I'd say just a little north of a dozen or so uh, water or sewer systems, and they're all funded by small service areas. And unfortunately, in the regional district structure, we're not able to share resources across various budgets. So um, those systems have to finance themselves. And there isn't a lot of opportunities for grants to do the capital upgrades and to keep up um, with the operational needs, uh, I might add, again, uh, downloaded by the primarily the provincial or federal government. So um, no well, how, at, how is Caribou oh, Regional District looking at asset management? Because I, I love talking about asset management. I think it's something that all municipalities need to sign on, all local governments need to sign on for, because it is one thing that can help plan the future of your community in a more effective way. What is Caribou Regional District doing to ensure that uh, a proper asset management is being brought in, or are there just ongoing conversations starting now to bring in a asset management program to ensure the longevity of your community with everything that's going on with the quote unquote downloading that you're seeing? Yeah, so um, we actually started a program a few years ago. Uh, so our previous chief financial officer flagged um, that uh, asset management was going to become an issue because we need to do some long-term financial planning uh, as pipes uh, wear out and you don't need to be replaced, whether it's water or sewer or, or even at your local fire hall. Um, one of the challenges we have in regional districts in British Columbia is that the same staff we would be having to do these asset management um, studies uh, then get pulled away uh, into local emergency operations center for um, whether it's flooding, wildfires, or other emergencies. So those uh, the, the asset management program tends to get shelved. Um, the Care Regional District just recently completed, successfully completed, I might add, a uh, strategic planning session. One of the things we've identified is the need to complete that process so that we can incorporate asset management into our annual budget cycle, including hiring a, a person that could, whose sole job would be to do asset management. Um, so. We're actually going to be, we're actually having a meeting actually, ironically, in my area at McLeese Lake on Thursday. And this is actually one of the topics to be discussed. And um, yeah, it's, I, I'm sure, Chris, you've interviewed many elected officials, and I'm sure it comes up all the time. And it comes down to just finite resources and the the things that the provincial fire government asks us to do keeps going up. And given the structure of how local governments are financed across the country, and this is another topic that's being discussed, uh, and it actually is being worked on here in British Columbia, um, our Union of BC Municipalities is actually talking to provincial government about envisioning how local governments are financed. Uh, and that's, that speaks to a number of pieces around how we do what we have to do, whether it's asset management, whether it's um, ongoing service delivery and, and the like. So. Fiscal management is one of these, the big bedrock of the FCM conference that happened in late May, if I'm not mistaken, early, I think in late May, early June. I'm not sure the exact dates right off the top of my head right now, but I know that uh, FCM President Scott Pierce, who I've had on the show, talked about that openly, that the federal government and all provincial and territorial governments need to come to the table because provincial and federal governments are asking uh, municipalities like yours and local governments like yours to do more with less. And it's not a feasible thing to ask people to do more with less. So I hope the union of British Columbia municipalities uh, has people coming to the table in the province and that conversation can start in BC because I know it's starting here in Alberta. So it's, I'm glad that to hear from yourself that BC is on the same path as well. 
Um, I want to turn to my last subject because we're at the 30 minute mark. I, 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 this time's flown by, but I want to turn to tourism. I love tourism. I love like tourism. If you've come on my show, I'm coming to your community and I'm going to be coming through uh, Caribou Regional District. So hopefully we'll be able to go grab a coffee while I'm through your community. But what are some of the hidden tourist destinations in Caribou Regional District that people need to come and see? So if you look behind me, Chris, you'll see a, a village with uh, teepees. So what's behind me is actually the Hatsuth uh, Heritage Village. Um, the Hatsuth First Nation people, they're part of the Northern Chushwap or Northern Shwetmik people, uh, nation. Um, they created this wonderful place uh, uh, almost, I think, two decades ago now, maybe pushing three. And the idea was twofold. Firstly, uh, to resurrect and to uh, support the culture uh, of the Hapsos uh, peoples. And also for the non-Indigenous people like myself to learn about uh, their culture and their practices and sort of what went into it, um, whether it's uh, bead making, whether it's um, uh, fishing along the banks of the Fraser River, which again, you can see in, in my background here. Is that the um, Fraser River? Sorry, for those who are I, listening to this uh, via audio, I apologize, but Director Forseth has a, a, a beautiful photo behind him. Hopefully he'll be able to send it to us so we can screenshot and put it in the show notes as well. But that's the Fraser River. Uh, that is indeed the Fraser River. Huh. I didn't realize. Okay, continue. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's that's probably the primary place I always encourage people to go and, and visit uh, annually during the summer. Um, they they're, they're, they are open only seasonally. So um, they just opened, I think it was May, uh, and they tend to keep it open until uh, September, October. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. But after a stressful day for yourself, after a long day of work, after a long day of being a director, is there a place in your community that you go to just decompress, that you can just let it all go and just recenter yourself? Because you know, in about 12 hours, the moment your head hits that pillow and wake up, you're going to be getting back into the swing of things. Where do you go in the community? Just let it all go. So I have, I actually have quite a few places. Uh, that's one of the, the brilliant things about being an area director is uh, there's quite a few places I can go. Um, again, I do go to Hatsuth Heritage Village. Um, there's a lookout overlooking the village here. Um, I, I just, it, there's a bit of a redeeming quality of just listening to the, um, the water flowing down the Fraser River. Um, there's also a little place I call uh, Lower Hawks Creek, which flows into the Fraser River. Um, I just get onto the banks and just listening to water is quite th theoretic. Um, and then I have, uh, again, McLeese Lake, I've got Reservoir Lake in my area. <clears throat> so there's lots of places I can actually choose and just do walks, et cetera, and just, and just walk about. So um, that sort of yeah. having a, a not great day at the office, uh, the next day I was like, okay, today I'm going to go to this lake and I'm just going to turn my phone off get away from the world and uh, just relax. It sounds like it's a outdoor enthusiast paradise up there. It is. Mm -hmm. So it begs the question, and this is the million dollar question, uh, Steve, what makes the Caribou regional district such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Well, um, I get a lot of people who are now moving from the Metro Vancouver area, the Okanagan. And the thing I've recently asked some new people that have moved into McLeese Lake, for example, and Wildwood, which is one of my other unincorporated communities, they told me that they want to get out of the rat race. Um, it was becoming expensive to live in the big cities. Um, one of the benefits of living in my area uh, is firstly, um, they can live out in the country, have country lifestyle free, kids can run about, uh, not worry about um, being mowed down by a car, et cetera, and, and just enjoy quite a, a healthy lifestyle, but still have access to the city, city amenities um, that Williams Lake provides uh, for um, my electoral area as well. So a bit of best of both worlds. I have a really weird question to ask, and I, I should have asked this beforehand. 
but being the caribou regional district i'm assuming there's a lot of caribou in the area or is this a, a name for something that happened a few years ago like is caribou a prominent feature within the community the communities um it can be um but primarily we see lots of uh, black bear and grizzly bear but um <laughs> there are uh, caribou across across the whole region well and that's thank sort of how that stuck Okay, perfect. I should have asked that beforehand, but I was like, I we haven't talked about caribou once in this, and it's the caribou regional district. But Steve, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this. You seem like you know the best interest at heart for your community, and you understand that local governance is a duty to serve, and the people who have put you in that position are your bosses. So thank you so much for serving your community, serving the great people of British Columbia and the Caribou Regional District and coming on and talking about yourself and talking about the community as a whole. So thank you. Yep, no problem. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your phone for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody, even if it's just someone in your own life. It helps their society, helps their democracy, and God forbid, it helps us be better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. We'll be back tomorrow with another great episode. Until then, just keep talking.